When a team moves to self-management, one of the obvious basic things that happen is that the roles that the team leader used to do, that the team manager used to do, get distributed among team members, right? Um, and, and by the way, I call them roles, but um, I was sympathetic to something that Astrid Vermeer and, and Ben Wenting, you know, who work for um, you know, Beardsorg, um, to say that they say, you know, we, we don't like to call them roles, we call them tasks, uh, really to insist that it's just simply tasks that need to be spread out around the team. Um, sometimes when you call them roles, you know, there might still be a tendency for our ego, our identity to get attached to these roles. There might even be then questions of like, oh, shouldn't I, you know, be paid more if I do these roles? Um, whereas really, you know, in their perspective, it's just sort of simply good hygiene. It's just tasks that need to be done and, you know, somebody, you know, the team needs to, needs to do them. Um, what strikes me when I hear of organizations that you know, have teams transition to self-management is that this obvious step of dividing the roles of the manager among people is often not really done um, or done kind of carelessly. Um, I, I often come across teams that simply say, oh yeah, we no longer have a manager, but um, you know, who holds the coordination role, right? Or there's a role of lead. Well, that just feels like rebranding, you know, the, the old role. You actually haven't done the work of looking at this box that we called team leader or manager and actually looking at what are all the roles that were in that box. Right? And, and so I think it's, it's really valuable. And you know, however granularly you wanted to define it, maybe you come up with five, 10, 15, 20 roles. Right? Um, here's a, a list of roles that I've come across or roles that I think make sense. Um, you know, there, there's a, a role, for instance, to set a vision and inspire the team. Um, there's a role to you know, keep reminding the team of the high expectations that you've set and, and, and to monitor results. Um, you know, there's a role to orchestrate feedback and performance conversations, uh, to provide technical expertise, to mediate conflict, and so forth, right? So you, know, you have here a list of you know, just a number of roles um, that you know, typically a manager uses to play. And, and it's up to you to you know, make your own list and define you know, what, what is right for your team and how you want to distribute the tasks. Um, but one thing that I want to just insist on is like nowhere here in this list does it say something like coordinator or leader, right? Because those things don't actually mean anything, right? Um, so really try to make this very concrete. Um, you've seen here that I've I've tried to use verbs to just try to show that these are simply task things that you do. Um, another thing that I think is fascinating when you look at the list like this is simply the notion that um, you know, when you used to have one single person, one single manager do all this, there's just no way that you have a manager who is good at all of these things and likes to do all of these things, right? So, Typically what happens is that you have a manager that likes a few of these things and does them, and then some other things that he or she doesn't like and never does, right? Um, you know, maybe I'm a manager and you know, I don't really like conflict, so I'm just avoiding conflict like hell and just conflict just ha keeps happening, right? Um, maybe I don't like to do performance evaluations. And, you know, maybe I only like to do you know, technical problem solving, and that's all I do, but then there's nobody who does these other things. And so the beautiful thing that happens when you move to self-management is that you know, these tasks can get distributed and you know, people can choose to do them because they actually like to do them and they're good at them. Right? So that is one of the reasons why self-managing teams often perform so much better is that you actually have people who are good at all of these things and who like to do all of these things. Um, so that's really, I think, a fundamental thing to understand about, about self-management, right? Is, is, you know, it's, it's based on our passion and something that we feel strongly about. Um, and then comes the question, okay, but so, you know, how do we actually define these various roles or tasks and how do we distribute them in the team? And most organizations simply do something very simple. 
right? Um, really just common sense. They just have a team meeting, get together, and then they list all of the tasks that the manager used to do or that you would expect, um, you know, tasks that are done for the, for the entire team. Um, you can base yourself on, on a list like this, but you can just make up your own. And then you just list them, right? Um, while you're at it, you might do that not only for the former task of the team leader, but for all the other tasks in the team, right? So that everybody now you sort of, you know, no longer has a job title, but just a series of roles. And then, you know, do it in whatever way, on, you know, on a flip chart, on a whiteboard, or, you know, make little pieces of paper. And, and then, in most teams, what I hear is that people simply volunteer, right? People simply say, yeah, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that, and, and that's it, right? And people know each other's strength and give each other feedback. And, and then sometimes there are roles that several people want, or you know, volunteer for, and maybe there's roles that nobody wants to do. Right, um, you know, like you like in every household, you know, you know, there's probably nobody who likes to, you know, bring the trash, you know, outside, but you know, somebody needs to do it. And there, you know, principle can be that, um, you know, roles can be rotated, right, um, so that everybody gets to do a role that they like, or that you know, everybody gets to do a role that needs to be done for the team, but that nobody really likes. Um, in certain cases, you can choose to have several people um, do a role together, um, even though that makes things more tricky in terms of accountability, um, but, but sometimes that happens too. Um, if needed, um, you know, for really more important roles, right, um, you can make sort of a more formal process. And the one that comes to mind for me, which is, I, I find is really beautiful, is the sociocratic election process, right? Um, if you just Google that sociocratic election process, you'll you'll find it. Um, in, in in French, they call it élection sans candidat, candidateless election, which I think is a is, is a beautiful way to uh, to put it. And it's um it's a beautiful way for a team of peers to, in a very non political way, really try to discern what are the qualities needed for that role. And once I look at the qualities needed for that role. Who do I feel, you know, is the best person in the team to fulfill that role? And there's no, there's no candidates, um, uh, but just names are, are put forward, and then there's a way to land on on one single name that that everybody, um, you know, supports. Um, two more things, two two rules of the games um, that you could consider um, about allocating roles and, and tasks. Um, the first one is that um, it's a really good rule of the game to avoid concentrating roles on one person, right? Um, at Beardsorg, for instance, you know, they, they've experienced that some teams sort of naturally have a tendency that a lot of these um, former managerial roles end up being concentrated again by one person. You know, if there's one person that is more senior um, or, you know, one person that used to be the team leader and even though we distribute them, you know, they, they go back and... And they have sort of an explicit rule that they want to counteract that. Like, we, we really want to make sure that roles are spread. Now, depending on your work, this is not always possible, um, right? There are some cases, um, you know, for instance, you know, Favi um, in north of France that I researched, you know, where, where people are manning machines all the time. It's, it's kind of hard to stop away from a machine when it's running. And so they find that, you know, um, some of the tasks you can do them sort of offline, but some of the tasks might happen at any time. You might need that to do them, and and so you know, they concentrate them still on somebody that at Favi I think um, unhelpfully they call a, a, a team leader. Um, but but yeah, that that's that's a possibility that sometimes you know you need to concentrate these tasks. Um, in that case, I think it's critically important that you do all of the other aspects of self management really right. Right, that you really use the advice process uh, and peer-based processes for all of the HR functions um, to make sure that this person isn't seen as somebody you know who holds power over other people. Right. Um, so that's that's one thing. Right. You could decide on a rule that we try to avoid concentration. Um, a second rule that you might want to consider is a rule that roles need to rotate after a certain time. 
right? I know that some organizations have done this and it seems to be working for them. Um, and what we have there is really sort of a tension between wanting to have as much competence in roles, um, but also these roles not you know, calcifying, not becoming positions again. And, and so that's, that's really tension that you can navigate and some people choose to make rotation um, mandatory to say that you know, after a year or six months or two years, you know, roles need to rotate. Um, and sometimes that, that can be tough. Let's say that you know, I'm just really, really good at you know, monitoring continuous improvement for the team and everybody just recognizes that. And so it, it might be easy for me and for the team to say, hey, come on, Fred, just continue doing it. You're so good at it, right? But there's a risk that if I stay in there for too long, that you know, other people are no longer learning. Other people don't get that opportunity. And that I build like a little position of power, a little fiefdom around my domain. Um, and that gets prevented if things rotate. So that's another thing for you to consider. So that's it. Um, I hope you got the main message, which is, you know, please distribute the roles or tasks um, that were within this box that we used to call manager and team leader. And don't do the lazy thing. Don't simply say, oh, we are, now we have a new role of coordinating or leading or something like this. Right? Really do the work of defining these roles and then distributing them in the team. Perhaps you've noticed there is no paywall, no monthly membership to access this video series. That's because the videos live in the gift economy. This is how it works. I gift everything that goes into making the videos, my time, energy, and insights, and you get to choose what feels right to gift back. Please take a moment to reflect on what would feel good to give in return to help me continue doing this work. Thank you.